Thank you everyone for joining our KIPS event today on building your skills inventory for a digital future with KIPS's CEO, Greg Lane. This is also KIPS's IT Professionalism Week, which is a yearly celebration held by KIPS across Canada to increase the awareness about the importance of professionalism, ethics, and standards in the IT industry and profession today. It's also a time to celebrate KIPS and our professionalism resources. If you're not currently a KIPS member, you can join at cips.ca membership. And as a member, you can assess your skills, get certified, network with other IIT professionals, volunteer and contribute back to the IIT community, attend events and professional development, and take advantage of a variety of member benefits. Uh, in particular, if you are currently a student, uh, KIPS currently has a great promotion where students can join KIPS for free, uh, experience some of KIPS's member benefits, and network with other IIT professionals. And once uh, students graduate, uh, they can obtain KIPS's AITP designation, which is the first step to obtaining KIPS's professional ISP and ITCP designations. Our speaker today is Greg Lane, who has over 30 years of leadership, leadership experience in IT. Greg has worked with product sales with Microsoft and Cisco, and has consulted with Deloitte and Accenture. His leadership experience includes volunteer activity with KIPS, ICTC, and ITAC, now Technation, and he has lectured at both Algonquin College and University of Ottawa on relationship building and IT governance. Greg is currently an executive resident at the University of Ottawa's EHA program and is the national CEO of KIPS, Canada's Association of IT Professionals. After Greg's presentation, we will have some time for a Q&A. And we kindly ask that you type your questions for Greg for the presentation in the chat. And then I, Jonathan Elias, will compile those questions for Greg. And on that note, I'm going to turn it over to Greg. Well, thank you, Jonathan. And welcome. Uh, really appreciate you all attending this morning. And we're going to start off by talking a little bit about KIPS and uh, what it is we uh, do and where we come from. And then a little bit about what we consider to be part of our challenge and uh, how we would like you to know how we're gonna uh, participate or, and or share in resolving that challenge. So let me just launch right into KIPS. So those of you that don't know is next year is our, <clears throat> excuse me, 65th anniversary. We've been around for a long time. Uh, some might argue we've been around even longer than information technology. So we were started by professors um, and the intent then was to establish standards, best practice, and to help people who are in the industry advance their career. We are a national federation of provincial regulators, and we license IT professionals in Canada and abroad. We, as Jonathan talked about, put on events, primarily intended to help uh, members network, build their professional network, and develop themselves. As I'm sure you'll all agree, um, IT is a fast-changing, fast-paced, industry and to keep up, it's, <laughs> it takes a lot of time and effort and it's a, an effort that has to be, in our view, shared and or learned in a collaborative environment. Uh, we certify IT professionals, as Jonathan talked about. There's a process <clears throat> to do that and we'll talk a little bit more about that. We also work with the universities uh, and colleges to accredit their IT programs. How do students uh, and faculty know or recognize that their program is gonna equip graduates to be successful in the industry. That's part of what we do when we accredit. We spend time looking at the program, the faculty, the whole experience, and making suggestions or recommendations on how it can be improved to make it more uh, useful for graduates. We provide an IT job board. So those of you that are getting a newsletter will see that on a regular basis, jobs are posted and make it uh, possible for members to apply. And Jonathan already talked a bit about benefits, but we believe that one of the things we're gonna talk about today, the skills assessment is a way for individuals to advance their career. Um, we provide members and others op opportunities to volunteer, meet their peers and colleagues, build a professional network. And as Jonathan talked about too, we have a discount or provide discounts on a variety of products and services. 
what is the purpose of KIPS? I mean, and I'm really proud to tell you these have not changed since we were created back in the 50s, right? So the intent is to determine, develop, and maintain the integrity and competence of individuals active in information technology. That's a huge sentence, but what it's saying is we are determined to help everyone who wants to be a professional in this industry uh, achieve that level and maintain that level for their whole career. We want to advance the theory and practice of information technology, and that means building a community, and I'll talk more about that. We want to promote the free interchange of information about the theory and practice of information technology. Where do you go? Who do you talk to? How do you trust whoever it is you ask that the answer you're going to get is correct and or appropriate? That's what we think KIPS should be doing. The other challenge, now that information technology is pretty much baked into every product and service that people get, the opportunity to have impact in a negative way is hmm, profound. So we believe public awareness and protecting the public is a uh, part of our core mission, if you will. Yeah, keep going, thank you. <laughs> Speaking of mission, protect the public. When we look at all the things that we can do and, and the importance of the work that we, we can contribute, protecting the public is interest through ethical and skilled information technology professionals and practice in Canada. That's our number one overarching goal. If people can't trust and don't believe that technology is there for their benefit, then it's gonna be a significant issue for everyone in our industry. So some fast facts. We've already talked about the fact we started in 1958. We are a national organization. So we, at National, I'm the national CEO. We try and coordinate uh, across the provincial entities and work collaboratively with our international um, colleagues. We see ourselves as a community. There's all different stakeholders in IT. There's academia, there's industry, there's our own members, there's all kinds of different organizations and, and entities that are part of IT and have a role to play. And we see ourselves as one of the central players trying to coordinate and collaborate with all the different parties. We are people, not companies. So we don't represent any brand other than our own. And we, we only care, quotation marks, around what happens to individuals. And our focus has been, for the longest time now, professional certification. We'll talk a bit more about that coming up. Certification, what does that mean? So a couple of things about certification. One of the things we've talked about is that for us as, a, as an industry to maintain, establish and maintain uh, public trust, we need to make sure that everything that people do in our industry it has an ethical um, aspect to it or ethics is central to all the work that is done. So as a prerequisite, every KIPS member uh, has to have uh, or adhere to the code of ethics and certified members have to pass an exam. So when we talk about certification, there's four elements that we focus on. Protecting the public in interest, as we've talked about a couple times now, privacy of information. So those are two key uh, tenets, if you will, of what we uh, believe and try and foster. Avoid conflict of interest. If you're a professional and in any industry, it doesn't really matter, but from an IT perspective, we're focused on anybody who's a professional should recuse themselves if they find themselves in a conflict of interest. Taking professional responsibility. So I know all of you have had different experiences and there's often times where there could be multiple stakeholders in, the, in a particular situation or circumstance that occurs the professional takes responsibility and puts his, his or her hand up and says, I did this and I can fix it or whatever else is required. And as part of uh, the whole industry, we believe it's important for individuals who have work experience, give back. So spending time with students, uh, coaching people that are new to the country, whatever it is that we can do as individuals to help because that's the expectation, expectation of an IT profession and professional. We talked a little bit about certifications. So it's important, I think, when industry or, or individuals are trying to understand who it is they're interacting with, 
if individuals have designations, badges, certifications, whatever you want to call them, that, that are recognized and give confidence about the particular individual they're dealing with. We have three that we're offering currently, the ISP, ITCP, which is internationally recognized, and as Jonathan alluded to earlier, the AITP. So for recent graduates, before they've got sufficient experience, they're able to have a designation that shows that they're on a path to become a certified professional. So once you've graduated from a recognized program and you've started your work experience, you can see yourself with a two-year horizon-ish before you can become certified, but that's the kind of timeline. Two years of experience after graduating. Who it is, we talked about community, who it is that we're establishing relationships with and what is the intent from those relationships? So partners, we have a number, uh, Electronic Recycling Association, as you can understand, it's a challenge in our industry when you're producing products that have the possibility, once they're no longer useful, they, they could cause harm. We wanna make sure they're dealt with appropriately. We're also interested in voice and being the voice of uh, IT. So we wanna work with organizations like IT World Canada, which is Fawn Annan's organization. And we blog with them, we uh, do events with them, we do a number of things with them. Skills TX, we'll talk a lot more about in a little while, but that's the uh, organization that we're working with and partnering with to allow members to have access to a, an assessment tool and to work with that tool to understand what their career opportunities look like going forward. And then we have relationships with businesses like Dazro Consulting and Bell, where we are looking to collaborate with them either on product sales or working with placement of people. On the international side, uh, the Federation of Enterprise Architects is a very important organization from us, for us. We're active members of IFIP. So the International Federation of Information Processing, which is the UNESCO body, we participate with them in a number of different initiatives and we share with them. So when, when there's a problem in Canada from an IT perspective, it's often not just a Canadian problem, it's an international problem. So being able to consult with our colleagues in other countries around what they've done and what problems they may have experienced and sharing all that insight is really valuable and helps us a lot um, in terms of accelerating whatever it is we're gonna do from a solutions perspective. Um, with new developments like AI, finding organizations that are like-minded as ourselves in terms of looking for ways to make sure that technology is used appropriately um, is what we're, why we've uh, um, partnered with Responsible AI. Some of you may know the, uh, what the Solar Accord is. Solar Accord is an, um, an agreement with a number of countries to jointly recognize or consider their computer science programs equivalent. So if you graduate from a recognized university in another country, you can come to Canada and have that degree recognized and vice versa. Canadians who graduate from uh, accredited uh, programs can have their degrees recognized in other countries. And we're active, and we'll talk a lot more <laughs> later about Sophia, skills framework for the information age. Um, this is a capability or a language, if you will, that allows people to define and describe capabilities in a way that's consistent and accepted across the broad community. Picking up on community, who is it in Canada that we're working with to try and move forward the agenda around ethical and competent IT practice. So Action TI are our uh, friends in Quebec. We like to give Canadians an opportunity to participate and share, not just in Canada, but overseas. So we work with CISO and, and look for volunteer opportunities for our members in other countries. The CIO Association of Canada, a very strong partner of ours that we're working on a number of different initiatives together because we have the same hope and expectation in terms of what's going to happen with talent in Canada. Same with Strategy Council. There's um, a need for standards, and CI Strategy Council is very active in helping us and helping others develop standards. CSCAN and InfoCAN, that is the group that is made up primarily of uh, deans and faculty heads from the CS, computer science faculties across the country, and information management. Um, faculties across the country. So that's our direct link into academia, if you will. Other associations or organizations that are doing similar work, like the Association of Public Sector IP Professionals, PPI, 
Tech Nation, ICCP, Institute for Certification of Computing Professionals, also looking at accreditation and, and other ways to make sure that programs that are offered are considered and seen as um, legitimate and or certifiable. The ICTC, um, lots of great research coming out of that organization, which is very valuable for us and helps us uh, frame some of the proposals and insights that we offer. And the Association of Accrediting Agencies of Canada. So a pretty broad-based group, uh, other associations and organizations that are like-minded or see the, the Canadian industry in a similar way that we do. On the international side, we've talked a little bit about some of these, but we're a founding member of IFIT, and they've formed another practice or organization under them called the International Practice Partnership, which is focused on professionalism and how to promote it in uh, IFIT members around the world. We've already talked a bit about ICCP and the certifying of different programs in different countries. And from a KIPS perspective, we have recognition with other countries or mutual recognition, Australian Computer Society, IEEE CS, New Zealand, and ICCP, their CCP program. So that's a little bit about KIPS. What is it we're trying to do? When I talk about community and when I say to people, KIPS is focused on trying to build more competent ethical talent for the country. So Jonathan helped me create this slide. And just to give you a little context, this was originally called Canada's IT Pipeline. And when I presented it to a few different stakeholders as a sort of trial run, I got some pretty significant pushback, especially from people out in the West Coast about pipelines. Apparently that's not a popular phrase. Um, so I don't use pipelines anymore. And the other correction to the title was public sector people apparently do not use IT the same way most of us in industry do, they prefer the term digital. Hence, that's where the title comes from. Canada's digital, I couldn't give up on the IT part, skill supply. And what I'm trying to communicate here from a KIPS perspective is, we see the challenge as being there are not enough senior specialists. So if you look at the bottom, the mid-career and senior, there's just not enough talent in the country to satisfy all the jobs and requirements that are out there. And I don't think it can be fixed by small actions or reactions in certain circumstances. I think it's a systemic problem. And we've got to start very early on. We've got to start at school age to get what I would argue are underrepresented populations in IT, particularly women or girls and indigenous people, but every um, underrepresented group, we want to find ways to start them as early as possible getting and thinking about or excited about IT careers and, and increase the diversity of the talent pool um, nationally and frankly internationally. So getting them interested is part of what we're working with IFIP on. Again, this is not a domestic Canada problem. This is an international issue. There just aren't enough people anywhere to satisfy the demand in any country and for sure not worldwide. Once we've got them hooked or interested, we hope, that interest will continue on through post-secondary and into their university careers. We're also looking at non-traditional paths. So non-IT students, if you're a graduate from a program that's got business, so and there are even faculties now that are focusing on technology inside the business. So BTM is one that we're working with, but looking for non-traditional paths for students to come into the uh, industry working with immigration, trying to find ways to help new Canadians and or people that have come to the country for different reasons. How do we get them into the industry? Many times they have some skills and we just need to help them find the right initial jobs to get the work experience. And, and other times, maybe they don't have a lot of experience. We can start them off early and train them. The other area of interest for us is skills transfer. So non uh, IT workers from other industries can be, and I hope in many cases, easily transferred into our industry. And the example I like to use is if you're a call center person in retail, coming over to, to be a help desk person or a support person in IT is not a huge change. You're already familiar with technology, the serving customers, helping people, 
that those are the skills that you can bring with you and we can teach you what it is you need to know from a technical perspective. All that to say is when I talk to different stakeholders, so governments, we tend to talk in this space and or this space because we're talking about education. With industry, I talk about there may be, and this would be an interesting problem to have because it's not an issue right now, but there may be an industry problem if we attract a lot of new talent. There could be a situation where entry-level jobs might risk overflow. So we might have to have industry overhire in places like help desks uh, and or support centers so that there's enough talent in here that we can continue to train and, and move through their career. So how is it we see ourselves supporting this whole conversation? If, if, we, if we accept, and I think people do, no, that's okay, keep going, Jonathan, that's fine, that there is demand exceeding supply, we look at the kinds of stats we see. So it's exceeding today. It's not for forecast to get better. In fact, the challenge is going to get worse if we don't start trying to look for ways to fix it sooner than later. So if we don't affect some of those paths and make it easier for people to join, <clears throat> excuse me, it's going to become a real problem for Canada. It's an issue today. It, it has risk of becoming a significant problem for us in the future. So what it is that we're trying to do to help? So this is where we get into the what is KIPS doing section. So the specific answer is we want to use Sophia. Jonathan, you want to flip? Sophia, we talked a bit about briefly before, the, the skills framework for the information age. It has a global footprint. It started in the UK, but now it's, in, I say 180, I think it's even more than that, and translated into 12 languages. And I'll talk about why that's important. <clears throat> One of the things that distinguishes Sophia from some of the other uh, skills areas is it's not just what you've done or the levels, it's how you've done it. So there's levels of responsibility. You can be on a team or leading a team. That's the same experience, but the level of responsibility is significant when you're assessing somebody's talent. So we also accept and or believe that any industry role in IT can be made up with a combination of Sophia skill. So when we talk about Sophia skills, those are attributes, if you will, that when combined can start to build role profiles that make it easy for somebody to understand what do I need to be successful in that kind of job. And what we think and believe is it's not just an organizational uh, opportunity or framework. Sophia can be used by anybody. So it's kind of one of those micro macro. At a micro level, any individual can manage his or her career and understand where he or she is and use that as part of their professional planning process. It, it is likened to a GPS system. Uh, when I was in consulting, there's three steps. Where are you today? Where do you want to be? And how do you get from where you are to where you want to be? My belief is, Sophia, is that kind of framework for individuals to plan their career. It helps you understand where you are, and we can show you or explain where, um, where you might want to be, and then how do you get there? So, Jonathan, you want to just show the big diagram of what all those attributes look like. So when I talk about 121 attributes, it's not just technical skills. As you can see from this diagram, there's change, there's relationships and engagements, there's people skills, and then levels of responsibility. So there are technical skills. We all accept and believe that in IT, you have to have technical skills. And increasingly, it's become uh, clear that the people with both technical and people skills are the ones that are able to progress and be more successful over time. And frankly, when you look at the skills that we're showing from a people perspective, those aren't necessarily IT skills. So that a lot of this framework can be and is now being adopted by other industries to help them do the same thing, combine technical with appropriate people skills and use that to explain what it is they're hoping that individuals can um, start to map their and show their career uh, progressing against. When you look at this, you see other views. 
what we're able to do is construct pretty much any job in IT from combining or by combining these different attributes. So if you wanna have somebody with a digital transformation role, you can take the skills that you want from this list and plug them in and create a digital transformation role. You can create cybersecurity data. You can create any role you want at pretty much any level. And the other thing I like about this particular um, framework, wanna to go to the next page? You'll recall that all, all of the categories had up to seven levels. Some of them were highlighted. Every level that's highlighted has an exceptional amount of uh, information available. So unlike some other programs or initiatives where it's not absolutely clear how it is you achieve any particular level, any level and any skill at, in uh, Sophia is defined in ways that makes it perfectly clear. If you've got these kinds of experiences and, and the capabilities, then this is your level. If you have more, you keep moving. If you have less, you go back. So it takes the mystery in my mind out of every conversation around where am I and how am I doing, all those kinds of things. Um, and if you've ever been in a staff meeting where somebody says, how do I know what the next level is? Having an answer like this, here's the next level, here's how you progress, here's what the difference between where you are and where you might wanna be. It's, it takes the emotion out and allows us to have a database conversation around what, where are you and what do you need? So how do we actually use this or how it's being used is when you combine this with levels of responsibility and accountability, you start to see how you progress from following to setting strategy. Everything is, my mind, laid out in a way that's completely understandable, easy <laughs> to use, and that's not always a simple conversation, an HR conversation, and it's being adopted um, by many, many uh, countries. We talked about 180, but one of the best examples is the next slide. So in Australia, uh, my friend Grant has created a capability where the public sector, so the federal government of Australia has adopted SOFIA for every role and every IT job in the Australian public sector. So by defining all of their jobs, and they've got 161 roles defined, and allowing anybody in any department to create their own career pathway and see what jobs are available, it starts to break down traditional barriers between organizations because you're speaking a common language. It doesn't matter what organization you work in, if the role you're applying for is defined and you completely understand that. So every role in these 161 is defined using SOFIA. You can see the role definitions. Their career pathway tool allows you to see where you are and see what the job is and show what the uh, potential for you is. Um, it's got uh, CVs built into it. It says currently in beta, but I believe they've launched it now. So uh, this is an example of how an organization has taken common language, applied it to a complex situation. I hope you would accept or agree that the Government Australia IT organization spread across all the different departments is complicated. It's challenging to understand and to be uh, using common language across very different organizations. This is the execution, if you will, of a way to build common language across this, an organization. And Australia writ large now is using SOFIA for most of their IT job and role descriptions so that people can understand where they are and where they wanna be across not just the public sector of Australia, but across most IT jobs in Australia. So I'm gonna turn it over now to Jonathan and let him explain to you how it is we're taking this capability, Sophia, and making it available to our members. Take it away, Jonathan. Great, thanks, Greg. So thanks for that awesome overview of Sophia. And we're gonna give a brief demonstration now of how KIPS members can use Sophia to assess their IT skills. 
So firstly, uh, KIPS members, uh, they can access the, skip, uh, the KIPS skills assessment and career planning tool at kips.ca slash uh, skills dash assessment. And you'll log in with your KIPS member login, uh, at which point you'll be able to assess your current IT skills, set your career goals, and develop targeted skills. But once you log into the skills assessment tool, uh, the first step is uh, taking the surveys. So the surveys essentially ask you a variety of different questions to discover what skill levels you have uh, in a variety of different skill areas. And uh, these vary from things like strategy and architecture to more general people and skills or relationship skills. And you can see here that each uh, survey uh, gives you uh, a brief idea of, of what how long the survey will take. Um, however, this ultimately depends on how many skills you have. Um, and the more skills you have, the more survey questions you'll be asked. Uh, but one nice thing is that you can um, always come back to this survey. You won't have to do it all in one sitting. You can take, you know, one or two short surveys. Some of them are, you know, four minutes, even one is only one minute. Um, and then come back and, and maybe do, you know, a 30 minute uh, more detailed assessment on, say, strategy and architecture. So once you complete all the surveys, you'll be emailed this nice output which essentially gives you uh, an overview of your general skills, as well as a breakdown of all your specific skills and what levels they are at. Um, and again, this is just a, a nice emailed uh, Word document that you can provide to your employers, your colleagues, your clients, uh, anyone who might find this useful. Now, this is what it looks like within the skills assessment tool. So within the skills assessment tool, after you complete the surveys, you can go into the specific skills and you can adjust your responses. Now, one thing that's really great about this is that it's also a nice way to learn about a variety of skills, uh, what the definitions are for the levels, and to get a better idea of where you currently are and um, what skills you need to upgrade in order to progress in your career. So in this example, you know, I'm editing my levels of autonomy. I'm reading a definition for level four, but maybe you know, I'm reading the definition for level five and I feel like that's a better fit. So I would you know, update that response and then up, update my uh, survey responses. So you've completed your survey, you've edited your skill levels, you have a good idea of what your skills are currently at. The next step is to do some planning. Um, and um, you know, it, it might be to see you know, how your skills relate to your current role, but um, I would argue more importantly, it's looking at what your future roles are. Um, so if you're the planner, you can overlay your skills uh, that you currently have compared to your current job or a future job. And uh, you'll see little buttons here that show, say show. Essentially what that does is it'll overlay um, the skills required for that future job compared to your current skills. And you'll be able to see some skills gaps. And it'll also give you uh, a general percentage of how well your current skills are matched to that future role. So then the next step would be to create an action plan. You know what uh, skills you have, you know what skills you need. Now you need to make a plan in order to upskill and address those skills gaps. And using the skill assessment tool, um, this is the action planner, which basically shows you what you've been assessed at. It shows you what levels you are for your current role, and then as well as your for a future role. Um, and so in this example, you'll see, for example, influence, I was assessed at Zephyr level five, but for the future role that I would like, I need level six. So I would then take some steps in order to take some uh, courses or uh, programs in order to obtain those new skills. And you'll see underneath here, it'll give you a breakdown again of what the skills are and the definitions. Um, and in this case, it's got a code um, ITSP5. And I've added in my action plan uh, PD again for uh, this code. Um, which is strategic planning at level five. Uh, these are some KIPS courses that I've uh, searched uh, using the predefined. Um, however, you can also just use a custom field and enter any custom uh, professional development programs or courses that uh, you feel will help you uh, upskill in this required areas in order to progress through your career. 
Uh, we also have through the predefined area, a section uh, where you can access our new member benefit, which is D2L Wave, which provides curated professional development. Uh, we have an event tomorrow that talks a little bit more about that. So if you're interested, uh, you can register on the CIPS.ca website. And so just basically summarize there is, you know, Greg has talked about the importance of building Canada's digital skill supply. And one of those steps is also to uh, build your own skills and the skills for your team um, and the organizations that you work for. So, you know, both from a, a micro perspective, it's very important to assess your skills, see where you're at, do some planning, see where you want to be in the future and upskill. And then on the macro side of it for your organizations or Canada uh, in, in, in a whole is that, you know, we need to take the steps in order, again, to build that skills inventory for um, our IT professionals across Canada and ultimately Canada's digital skills supply. So on that note, we're going to turn it to the, the questions portion. Uh, if you do have any questions, please post that in the chat. And uh, I will uh, take some questions for Greg from the chat right now. And the first question that we have here is, um, Greg, how does the ISP and ITCP certifications designations help uh, an, uh, immigration to Canada? Um, so talking about benefits of KIPS designations, um, and they also uh, mentioned uh, new Canadians using the the NOC system. Well, that's a that's not a question. That's a series of questions, I think. <laughs> so the short answer is one of the challenges that anybody faces when they're um, starting or restarting a career in a different country is a you don't have the same network that you had in your previous country, wherever that might be. And B, whatever credentials or certifications or recognitions that you may have received may or may not be um, recognized or understood even in uh, Canada, for instance. So I talked about Solacord. One of the challenges, if you're coming from a computer science program in another country that is recognized in Solacord, you have an advanced standing, if you will, or people will accept that, that yes, the education you've got is equivalent to the same education would, that you would get in Canada. So that's a, one advantage. The other is for recognized certification. So we're using SOFIA to assess people's skills against the requirements for ISP and ITCP. And Jonathan and or MJ um, can talk more about that, but that's the intent is we're going to be using the same uh, process for uh, assessing somebody's skill level as uh, you would use for doing your own self-assessment. So going forward, if somebody wants to apply from an ISP from another country, they do the self they do the self assessment, provide us their CV, and we uh, audit or assess whether or not their um, CV and assessment um, match and are consistent with the requirements for ISP and ITCP. And we believe that that will help you in a conversation with an employer or a hiring manager around: Are you able to do the work? So either of those designations in my mind, show that you're able to learn, that you've got a base level or even advanced levels in certain areas. And that's something that most employers will be willing to, and I don't want to use the term take a risk, but I will take a risk hiring you because, because many times people hire people that are referred to them or are coming from uh, employees already. And those are lower risk and lower challenges. Um, so anything that will lower the threshold for you getting into organizations or help you get into organizations, and we believe ISP and ITCP will, will do that. So I don't know if that's a great answer, but that's, uh, that's my perceived answer. And as more people recognize and, and support ISP and ITCP and micro-credentials, um, we hadn't talked about that, but we're going to be offering in the new year micro-credentials as well that build somebody towards having um, other certifications. And Greg, I'd just like to add also the uh, government immigration programs, um, in particular, the government of Saskatchewan is a big one. Um, they, throughout the year, have uh, different uh, promotions where they are uh, accepting KIPS designations uh, as uh, express entry routes, entry routes into KIPS Saskatchewan's immigration program. Um, so, uh, you know, I'd say definitely look at the provincial immigration programs, but 
the first step is you know making sure that you have the designation so that you're ready to apply when um, they open up those spots. Great, that's a good point. Thanks, Rob. So next question here is um, what interested? Um, sorry, are you, what are you seeing, Canada, for recruitment, testing, and screening? Alliance to Sophia. So, so I think you just Jonathan just partially answered that. So we are using Sophia, and we're proposing to use Sophia with multiple different organizations. So. I didn't talk a lot about it, but one of the things we're uh, working with different or applying to work with different uh, ministries and, and departments in different jurisdictions across the country is how can we make um, these kinds of tools and capabilities more broadly available? And how can we find courseware to support? Jonathan talked about the fact that once you've got your assessment and you wanna see yourself moving forward on different roles, because in that tool, there's 600 job profiles. So you can do a couple of different things. You can say, what's the best fit for me? And if that job is something you want to do, you, it makes it easier for you to apply because the logic associated with why you should be accepted for that kind of position is right there. It's, it's in the Sophia report. So the more people and the more times we use Sophia for different purposes, I believe it'll start to become much, much more broadly accepted. As I say, we're already talking to different departments of labor and immigration in different parts of the country and putting proposals in front of them about why we think Sophia is the right tool for them to use in a common language across all of these different immigration opportunities and organizations. And we're getting some traction in that space. Um, and we're talking to our international colleagues as well from other countries, what are they doing? And how are they seeing Sophia and other tools like uh, that are built on Sophia being adopted? And where can we take advantage or bring some of those capabilities and tools into the Canadian environment or context. We're actively working, just so you know, with the OCIO, the Office of the CIO for the Government of Canada, trying to get the Government of Canada to see that this tool can be used or capability can be used by them. And if that's the case, it starts to give us a lot more uh, credibility slash traction slash whatever with um, other large employers and immigration departments across the country. So we're, I think, evangelizing or or trying to, to be evangelists for this kind of capability. And we're starting to get people listening because IT is complicated, it's difficult, and it's almost impossible. I would argue it is impossible for any single country to maintain some capability like this. But if it's an international collaboration, the way Sophia is, it makes it A, um, better because more different perspectives are being used to create it. And it's easier because more different people are maintaining it. So as a tool, I think it has um, great shelf life and has great future potential as well. Yeah, great. Uh, next question. Uh, how does Canada's skill shortage compare internationally to other countries? So I don't have the data for every country broken down, but I know for the countries that I spend time with, like New Zealand and Australia, it's very similar. So we see IT growth, <clears throat> IT job growth, excuse me, outstripping demand in every other industry. And as more jobs in different industries are IT centric, non-traditional industries are using IT a lot more. So I can tell you that in Australia, they have the same problem, South Africa, Britain, um, most of the countries that um, we talk about on a regular basis are struggling with the same issues and most of them are adopting uh, national and uh, provincial programs to try and stimulate either domestic growth in IT skills or immigration to supplement uh, national labor pools. So it's, as I said earlier, it's not a Canadian problem. It's an absolute global challenge. Um, the CIO of Canada, Catherine Loello, described it as a war for talent. So. And I, it's a bit strong, but I, I understand what she's trying to communicate with that. We have to do everything we can to compete and to try and promote Canada as a destination for international IT talent. Awesome. I really like this question. It's good timing. It says, do we have a forum for KISS members to socialize virtually <laughs> and interact with existing members and players? Um, well, so I'm going to turn this back to you. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, yeah, so yeah, KIPS is uh, launching our um, KIPS Community Forum platform uh, in November. Um, so you'll be hearing about that in the coming weeks. Um, but yeah, essentially, um, it's um, a discussion website, which will have uh, various discussion groups. Um, it'll have a more general kind of water cooler talk forum group. Uh, it'll have uh, provincial society groups uh, um, so that you can interact with members locally. Uh, and then as well as uh, more focused uh, special interest groups. Um, and it'll be um, you know, a great way for KIPS members to communicate with each other, both locally, uh, across Canada, internationally. Um, I'm, I'm excited about how KIPS is gonna use it in a variety of ways, even, even just our volunteers, how they can get together and, and even little things like KIPS members uh, planning uh, get togethers, you know, maybe it's a, a local pub night or something, but yeah, really excited about it. So you'll be uh, hearing about that KIPS Community Forum website in the coming weeks. And post COVID, I think there's more opportunity for face-to-face -face and forum. Yeah. So we're, <laughs> touch wood, very hopeful that we can get back into a much more normal um, event and or networking uh, rhythm, I suppose. Yeah. All right, uh, last question here, unless uh, anyone has last minute questions, please put them in the chat. Uh, I think you've uh, kind of covered this already, but um, it's uh, how can Sophia skills assessment be used for organizations? So I talked about micro macro. So the view is that, um, and we've got, a, as I talked about earlier, CIOs are becoming more and more interested. So the conversation I had with a particular CIO recently was, um, is the talent pool that he has in his organization appropriate for the demand that he's faced today with from his current client community and or is it going to be capable of supplying or delivering what the clients need looking forward so where are you today from a talent perspective and is it sufficient and or where will you be in a year or two down the road as demand changes because uh, we've talked already a, a bit about the fact that not only are we uh, progressing as individuals but organizations are growing and expanding in their footprints and products, all kinds of things are changing on a regular basis, and the industry is changing. So it's a bit like a lunar launch, right? So when you think about what they're doing in Florida, they're launching a rocket to hit the moon, which is moving. So the target's moving, and the platform's moving. The Earth's rotating. There's all kinds of things. So the level of complexity, I think, is going to get more difficult. So as managers try and deal with where are they today, what kind of talent do they need in the future, and how can they put together a plan or a program to make sure their individuals that are currently working with them are retrained or upskilled, reskilled, whatever the right uh, requirements are, and they're knowledgeable about what kind of talent they need to attract and recruit into the organization. That's what I believe Sophia can help them with. So if you take an individual um, report and then start accumulating your team's reports, you can start to see where your team skills are at, you can start to see where you need or have gaps. And instead of agreeing to whatever training people might want, you can start to see, well, no, we need more people trained in these areas and then send your employees to take courses that are going to have value for them and for the organization. So it's, it's <clears throat> if an individual needs a map, then I think it's even more, more challenging and or required that CIOs or leaders need larger maps with more potential uh, challenges on it and better ways to deal with them. And I think that's what Sophia can provide. So micro macro, if that makes sense. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Greg, for that uh, great overview of KIPS and Sophia and how individuals and organizations and Canada can take advantage of Sophia and, and his framework. So thank you everyone for attending this uh, IT Professionalism Week event. Uh, if, again, this is uh, the D2L Wave uh, KIPS member benefit that we'll be launching. We have an event tomorrow. We're going to be walking you through uh, this member benefit and how you can take advantage of it to find that professional development in order to upskill in a variety of areas. Uh, and then Wednesday, we have an IT Professionalism Week event with um, the KIPS Saskatchewan president, Thomas Boxel, who will be talking about a soldier story of IT in the military. 
So two great upcoming events. Uh, we hope that you guys can join us for those events as well. Um, and again, if you aren't currently a KIPS member, please join us at cips.ca slash membership. And thank you everyone for your time and joining us today. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at future trips events. And again, thank you so much, Greg. Really appreciate all your insights. No, it was fun. Thanks, everybody. And hopefully we'll uh, chat uh, ideally face to face, but in one way, shape, or form in the coming weeks and months. All the best. Thanks. Thank you.